Franz Stangl. Long before coming to public office, Hitler, as leader of the Nazi party, had his own police force. By the year 1933, this private army contained 400,000 men, which was four times more than the number of soldiers the entire country of Germany was allowed under the terms of the World War I peace treaty. These fanatical men who swore their loyalty not to Germany but to Hitler arrested and beat people at the slightest provocation. They provoked crowds into rioting against Jewish shopkeepers and damaging Jewish property. Together with the Gestapo, these men aided in the building of the concentration camps, one of which was the infamous Treblinka, run by the equally infamous Franz Paul Stangl. Franz Paul Stangl was born in Altmünster, a town located on the western shore of the Tronsee in Upper Austria on the 26th of March in 1908. When Stangl was only eight years old, his father died of malnutrition and later his mother remarried to a widower. After leaving school at the age of 15, he became a weaving apprentice. Five years later, in 1931, he realized his job held no further prospects for him, and so he applied to join the Federal Austrian Police. After being accepted and following a year's worth of training at the police school in Linz, he served his probation with the riot squad. In the year 1935, he was transferred to the Criminal Investigation Department in a small Austrian town named Wells, and a year later he became a member of the then illegal Nazi Party. Following the Nazi annexation of Austria in March 1938, Stangl's department became absorbed into the Gestapo, and Stangl was promoted to the rank of Criminal Oberassistent under the supervision of George Prohaska, a Bavarian police officer. On the 3rd of November in 1940, he joined the T4 Euthanasia Program. He joined under the order of Nazi leaders and was appointed as the head of security at Hartheim Castle. At the time, Hartheim was one of the secret killing centers used by the authorities to administer what they claimed were mercy deaths to sick and disabled persons. A special unit within the German administration, which held the code name T4, carried out this euthanasia program. T4 employed doctors, nurses, lawyers and police officers, among others such as Stungel, at killing centers in Germany and Austria. In total, historians estimate that the staff at Hartheim killed 18,269 people by August 1941. By the early spring of 1942, Stangl was ordered to report to Lublin and was given the command of the Sobibor death camp in eastern Poland. Stangl was in command when the camp received their first Jewish transports in May 1942. Stangl used his weaving skills to sew himself the famous white linen uniform, which later gave him the nickname White Death. He preferred to wear his handmade uniform due to the amount of insects, as well as the heat in the Sobibor and Treblinka camps during the summer. In August 1942, Stangl was transferred from Sobibor to Treblinka to take over the command of the camp from Dr. Ebo. Treblinka was a camp which had the sole purpose of extermination. It was only 50 miles from the large city of Warsaw. Treblinka opened on the 23rd of July in 1942, primarily for the resettlement of the Jews in the Warsaw Ghetto. At the time, the three small gas chambers were not ready for use when the first train loads arrived, so the guards simply machine-gunned their victims as they spilled onto the railway platform. By March, 10 new gas chambers had been installed that could each hold up to 200 people at a time, and so the camp was running fairly efficiently. In an effort to conceal the camp's purpose from its victims and avoid hysteria for as long as possible, the unloading platform had been made to look like any other railway station with props such as schedules and timetables and advertisements posted. The road that ran a few yards from the station to the gas chambers went past empty buildings that appeared to be functioning stores and shops. However, every day 5,000 Jews were transported from Warsaw to Treblinka. Thousands came from other ghettos as well. Between the inhumane conditions in the cars, the executions and the gas chambers, over 800,000 eventually died at Treblinka. Stangl had a knack for organization. While there, he managed and perfected a system in which he used psychological techniques to first deceive, then terrify and subdue his victims before they entered the gas chambers and met their ends. In less than 18 months, under Stangl's supervision, between 870,000 and 925,000 Jews were killed at Treblinka. Throughout this, he maintained very little contact with the victims he sent to their deaths or the Jewish prisoners and was rarely seen. He received an official commendation as the best camp commandant in Poland. And then came the revolt. As the rumors of Russian advances filtered into the camps, the inmates began to grow restless. When the processing of people through the death camps slowed, 
The prisoners who remained alive sensed that their usefulness to their captors was coming to an end. The possibility of liberation was not nearly as strong as the certainty that the SS would leave no witnesses to their deeds. Many prisoner revolts were spurred by a mix of hope and desperation. They were all crushed, but they did hasten the closing of some camps. At Treblinka, around 100 internees formulated a plan, not just for escape, but for takeover and destruction of the camp. A number of the bloc leaders and four men agreed to participate. They knew the Nazis would not spare their lives when the camp was inevitably closed. The attack was carefully and precisely plotted. Weapons would be available because a prisoner locksmith had worked for several months making a key to the camp arsenal where rifles and grenades were stored. Everyone was given a role. Some were to shoot the sentries in the watchtowers, others to overpower the guards in the camp. Some were to cut the telephone lines, others the wire fences. Some were to set certain buildings on fire. Timing was of the utmost importance. At 4.30 in the afternoon, the guards would be tired. The prisoners also would have had enough daylight to carry out their revolt, as well as the cover of darkness, to aid for their escape. It was crucial that everyone act at once, catching the guards totally by surprise. The signal to begin would be a single rifle shot. And so, on the 2nd of August in 1943, prisoners seized arms, set camp buildings on fire, and attempted to escape using the main gate. Despite facing machine guns, several hundred prisoners were successful in breaking out of the camp. Unfortunately, more than half were later traced and killed by Nazi authorities. The revolt brought operations at Treblinka to an end. Prisoners who had not managed to escape Treblinka during the revolt were then shot by camp authorities. Afterwards, the camp, which had suffered extensive fire damage, was dismantled and evidence of the camp destroyed. Only 67 people are known to have survived the camp, and their testimony provides much of what is known about the camp. After the Treblinka revolt, Stungel was sent to northern Italy, where he spent a short period of time at the San Saba camp in Trieste. While there, he engaged in construction projects and actions against partisans and Jews. When the war ended, he fled to Austria, where he was interned by US forces because of his association with the SS. Starting from the summer of 1947, he was imprisoned in Linz, but escaped. In the year 1951, like many former Nazis, he migrated to Brazil with his family, and while in Sao Paulo, he worked in the Volkswagen factory. It was not until mid-1960 that the Nazi hunter, Simon Wiesenthal, discovered Stungel's whereabouts. Simon Wiesenthal, who was a survivor of the Nazi death camps, had dedicated his life to documenting the crimes of the Holocaust, as well as to hunting down the perpetrators who were still at large, such as Stungel. Upon receiving a bounty of $5,000, an informant agreed to divulge Stungel's address. Stungel was finally betrayed by his son-in-law, who had also been a former SS man. For $5,000, he gave away Stungel's whereabouts. The Brazilian government agreed in 1967 to Stungel's extradition to West Germany, on the condition that if he were found guilty and sentenced, he would serve a definite term rather than life imprisonment. He was immediately arrested by the Brazilian authorities. In 1967, Stungel was extradited to West Germany. During his first hearing at the West German court, he declared that while he could not deny that he'd been commandant at Treblinka, he had not been involved with the killing of Jews and others. His duty, he said, had been solely to supervise the collection and shipment of valuables brought into the camp by the victims. The individual responsible for the killings had been a man named Christian Wirth. Franz Stungel was the only commandant of an extermination camp who they managed to bring to trial. He was tried in the Treblinka trial. In 1970, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. He died in the Remand prison, Dusseldorf, on the 28th of June in 1971, due to a heart attack. He had just concluded a series of interviews with Gita Sereni, an investigative journalist, whose unflinching studies of some of modern history's most reviled figures attempted to make sense of their crimes. These interviews were published in her book, Into That Darkness, in 1974, he is gone, but his cruel deeds will never be forgotten. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please click the like and subscribe button so you can enjoy more walks through history.